I love sulfur. I just think sulfur needs to be out there more. It needs to be hyped up. I, we need to make this the year of sulfur because there are so many things that I use for to treat with sulfur. And like it really is just such a multifunctional ingredient that helps to calm skin. It helps with perioral dermatitis, rosacea, acne. I mean, it is an ingredient that does it all. And I don't know why it's not incorporated into more skincare products. On today's podcast, we have Dr. Lindsay Zubritsky, also known as Derm Guru. She is a dermatologist you've probably seen all over your TikTok. She came on the scene a couple of years ago and has very rapidly amassed a very large following. And when you look at her content, it's very easy to see why. She takes super science-heavy, complex topics and is able to make them really digestible and actionable so that you can actually take those tangible tips and put them into your own skincare routine. Her content has helped thousands, maybe even millions. And this episode covers some of your most frequently asked questions about skin, hair, even procedures. Buckle up because we cover a lot in a short time. Okay, Dr. Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I am so grateful that you're taking the time from your busy schedule to chat with us. I, when I said you were coming on, I got more questions that I've gotten for any other guests. So I'm really excited for them to hear from you. And I always start the podcast with asking, what is your first skincare memory, your earliest memory? Oh gosh, <laughs> this is embarrassing. But I remember being in college and using the St. Ives scrub. Like that was my, I know, I know. I'm like so embarrassed to kick this podcast off with like my biggest skincare mistake. But we've all been there, right? And I yep. think it just proves how far you can really come from those days. But yeah, the apricot scrub, that was the thing back in you know the 2010s and early skincare life. It's so true. And I think sometimes I even do this, like when I'm watching dermatologists or skin experts on social media, you forget that they had another life, right? Like that the in our minds, we're like, oh, you were always a skin expert. But no, we've all like, I used to go to the tanning beds in high school. And now like I, I'm, you know, wouldn't be caught dead. So it's so funny. And as you said, we do evolve. And thank goodness the trends also evolve. And that's no longer trending because I think the only thing that saved me is my skin was so sensitive. I could have never used it. So that's probably the only reason I never did. Yeah. <laughs> did you always want to be a dermatologist or did you have other aspirations when you were younger? You know, it's, I don't know if this is weird or crazy, but I always did. Like I was in high school and I remember writing down on, you know, one of those like questionnaires that they ask you for the newspaper or something like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said either a dermatologist or an optometrist. So I always knew it was like skin or eyes, but it's, you know, here I am many years later and I really did stick to that goal. I knew I wanted to be a doctor since I was a little girl. My wow. grandmother was a nurse and she really inspired me to go into the field, but derm came very early to me. That's really cool. I think it's rare that we hear that. Usually it's something that people decide later, like in med school or even residency. So that's really cool or, you know, in med school. So it's really cool that you you had those thoughts so young. And we just were chatting about this off air before we started, but you really have been balancing it all the last couple of years. You have had two kids in a very short amount of time and you've really blown up on social media. I think of all the experts I follow, you have really grown so quickly. And what do you think people resonate with so much with your content because there is something very special about it that I think people really are drawn to. I think that people really resonate with, you know, simplicity and explanations, a little bit of humor and demystifying the things that we see, either be it in the skincare aisle or what they see on online or what they hear from their friends. And so there's just so much noise out there. And my goal is to try to break through that and really help to simplify it, explain it, talk about trends, but make it like in a really fun, sort of engaging way. And so I find that people really are drawn to, for example, my use this, not that. So I came up with that idea because when I was younger, I remember I had no clue about diet and there was the, you know, eat this, not that. And I always read those articles and I thought, this is so interesting. Like I thought that this was good for me, but it's not. And this is what you should do instead. So I thought, oh, I should do 
a skincare version of that. And that I think, you know, of all the things I've ever done has been one of my most popular videos. And I still have people tell me all the time how much they've learned from that, which I really love hearing. I do love those videos because as you said, they are very concise. So it's, if someone, I think sometimes we, the consumer gets overwhelmed with education sometimes. So to have it put so easily for them to digest that, it, it probably makes their life a lot easier because everyone is bombarded with educational content now, especially if you're someone who's interested in skincare, right? That's, we, there's so many experts out there. So I think that it makes sense to me why that, that series has been so popular because it just makes it so easy to decide what to use for your skin. I love those. And how do you really balance it all? Like with the, your career, being a mom, like are you still in, are you still practicing and seeing patients every day of the week? I practice three days a week, which okay. still, it doesn't sound like it's a lot, but my gosh, is, I feel yeah. it is. And every single day, I'm, I just feel like I'm, I'm barely surviving, but I'm just trying to do my best. You know, we all feel like we're spread thin, but it's so important to me that I still see patients that I'm still practicing because at the end of the day, I'm a dermatologist, not a content creator. And that's so important to me because I got my degree to help people in real life. And so while I can help so many people online with just a video, it's that one-on-one, -on -one, it's watching that child with, you know, 60% body surface area, atopic dermatitis that's ruining their life, watching them go from that to totally clear on, on a medication uh, is the reason that I do what I do. And so that really is something that I don't think I can ever give up. And I really much enjoy doing it, but I'll tell you, it's, it's not easy as my content creation continues to take off. It's very difficult finding a balance between being a practicing dermatologist, making content, being a mom of two, and then still continuing to make sure I put my own health and my own priorities at the forefront to make sure that I'm the healthiest so I can do all these things for all these people. I like that you mentioned that because I have a lot of these conversations with really high achieving women. And while like goal setting and stuff like that always comes up, I don't think anyone's ever put it that way. It's such a good reminder that y no one you – you can't pour from an empty bucket, as they say. So what are some things that you do when you find the time to kind of care for yourself and just uh, keep yourself healthy and, and care for your yeah. wellness? Even though I probably don't have the time to do it, I make the time to work out every single day. Probably six days a week I will work out, even if that means, you know, I lose an extra hour of sleep or – whatever that may be, but I am really into fitness and that is my one hour a day that is just me because from the second I wake up to the second I go to bed, it's go time. You know, it's seeing 30 plus patients in clinic. It's taking care of two little children under the age of three, getting them to daycare, you know, taking care of the house, focus, get, making sure I get my content out. That is my one hour that I have no other excuse but to just focus on me and releasing some of that energy. So that's 100% what I do to care for myself. I think that's a good point. I think that we get wrapped up in sometimes that wellness has to be everything where we have to get eight to nine hours of sleep. We have to work out daily. Then there's this get the step count in and then the food. I think it really isn't. It's like that chart, the meme you always say where it's like sleep, eat, like pick, you know, like you have to pick. You can only pick so many. And so I feel like just getting in one thing into your routine that makes you feel better. For me, exercise is definitely one of them too. But I do find like I have to kind of cut into my sleep sometimes, but I've just become okay with that fact that there's something has to give. And that's kind of the one that's going to have to give at this point in my life. And then maybe later, you know, we can work on that a little bit more. But I love, I love that you mentioned that, you know, it doesn't have to be every, you don't have to do it all, but just do something, commit yourself to something that makes you feel better. And I saw when you were pregnant with your last beautiful baby that you were working out literally until, <laughs> like, didn't you work out like the day before or something yes. that you just <laughs> went into, or you were induced or whatever it was? You know, the priorities of a working millennial mom, I, it was the AED right before. So it was actually in New Orleans, which I live about an hour outside of the city. And so I was driving into the city, going to the AAD all day, coming home, and then I would I would wake up, I would go to CrossFit, I would do my CrossFit workout, then I'd drive back to the AAD, all while I'm literally 39 weeks pregnant. This was on like a 
Thursday through a Sunday, I was doing that. And then Monday was my elective C-section schedule. Wow. That is so crazy to me. I, I was like in awe when I was watching your stories that weekend. I was like, I cannot. I like the, the weekend before my C-section, I was on the couch, like completely vertical. Like, no, I was just watching TV the whole weekend. So, wow, good for you. That's really incredible. And I'm sure probably your postpartum experience reflected that, that you were so healthy during your pregnancy as well. For sure. And, you know, I, I can't take all the credit. It's something that I really do enjoy doing. People ask, like, where do you get the motivation to do it? But it's like the same way that people really enjoy doing their skincare routine. I enjoy working out. So I just feel like I'm one of those very lucky people who get so much out of it and I look forward to it. So it wasn't like it was this big chore to do or anything that I feel like I deserve congratulations for. I just really, really enjoyed it. And it did make my postpartum journey so much easier. I was, you know, back trying to work out <laughs> like five weeks and my CrossFit gym was like, get out of here. What are you doing <laughs> like, here? You know, you're not <laughs> yeah. allowed in here for a little bit while longer. Exactly. That's so funny. <laughs> and your practice right now, three days a week, how much is general and how much are you practicing cosmetic dermatology? So I would say the majority, actually, I think maybe people might be surprised by this, is is um, mostly general dermatology. So I very much enjoy the bread and butter of dermatology, which I think does kind of is reflected in my social media. I enjoy treating acne. I enjoy treating atopic dermatitis and eczema. I enjoy psoriasis. I probably do like 70% general dermatology and then the rest of the of my days are split between surgery and cosmetics. So I do filler and Botox, but then I also remove and excise my own skin cancers. I excise cysts and I find all of that to be very enjoyable. I like variety in my life. All of my colleagues that do at least half general derm or more I always tend to be like they they seem the most the happiest and the most fulfilled so it's interesting I think there's just always going to be that aspect of caring for a patient in a disease state that you can't get that kind of it just it feels really good to help them in that state versus cosmetics are fun but there's something very rewarding about helping somebody out as as you mentioned so I want to talk a little bit about skincare. First off, when so I've heard different things from different dermatologists, and I know in residency, in residency sometimes there isn't a comprehensive kind of skincare component, right? Like like most of us, you're kind of learning that after and, and learning on your own. So would you say from the beginning you were very passionate about skincare, or is that something you kind of developed later on as you got more experience? Yeah, I, I remember being in residency and being one of the only people who was so interested in skincare. And actually we had, I don't even remember who it was, but someone came in to talk to our program about skincare and no one else in the whole department was excited about it. And I was sitting there like taking notes and I like was, and I still have it in my iPhone notes to this day, like what was being said. And I just thought, wow, this is so fascinating. Um, and so from there, I really started to get an interest in it. And I took it upon myself to learn a little bit more. And actually, it was, it was social media, even when I was in residency, that inspired me to want to share that information. So I remember people like Joyce Park and Jenny Liu, they were doing social media way before I was. And I looked up to them and I follow them. And even you, I remember you're one of the first people that I started following and I just thought, oh, you guys are doing such cool things. Like I'd love to be part of this community and I want to share my knowledge as well. And so that's kind of where I and how and why I started my social media accounts. I think that's a really good point that I want to just stop on for a second because I know that there are a lot of people in this space or maybe unrelated, maybe they're not in dermatology, they're not in skincare, but feel like the space is saturated, right? Like they see all these people producing content and they feel like maybe they have something to say and they could say it differently, but they're afraid. And I mean, just you're such a great example. You've come in and all you have done is share your knowledge in a relatable way. And it has just absolutely skyrocketed. And so many people have benefit from the information that you've put out there. So I think it's a really good lesson that there's always a place. So if anyone's listening to this and they're thinking like it's too late for them to try to break into the content creation space, space if you have something you want to say, there's always room, you know, there's always room and you never know what might happen. 
Exactly. And I think to that point, though, is no longer is it just like you have to get into TikTok or you have to get into YouTube. Like you can try all these different platforms and see where you feel the most comfortable and see where it, you resonate the most and see what does well. Because I know a lot of people who do well on TikTok and not Instagram and vice versa and YouTube. And so there really is, even though they seem the same, that you know YouTube has shorts and Instagram has reels and TikTok has their videos, they all have different sort of audiences. And so just because you don't do well on one platform doesn't mean you can't succeed in others. So my recommendation would be, and I think you you agree with this as well, is to do as many different platforms and content as possible to see what resonates and to see what you enjoy doing and to see what people like. Yeah, absolutely. There is an audience for you somewhere. It's just a matter of finding it. And it is it is funny. I can, I'm can i sure you're the same way. I can almost tell when I'm putting out a piece of short form content whether or not it's going to do well on a platform. Just like it's just this innate feeling about that yeah. piece and like things that do well on TikTok don't always land on Instagram and vice versa. Exactly what you just said. So it is really interesting how these platforms have evolved, how the audience on these platforms have evolved. And I also find like the, the following and the viewers are so different. Like I remember when I very first started on TikTok, I was like all of a sudden like had these like really harsh comments that I'd never seen in like my six years on Instagram. And I was like, wait, wait, what? And so I definitely got a thicker skin when TikTok came on board and now I'm like dabbling in YouTube. And I think it's kind of fun. I think, you know, like when I started this podcast, starting something from scratch is really exciting because your audience on other platforms doesn't always follow you elsewhere. So it is fun to like kind of really start from the beginning and try to build something. And and there, as I said, there is definitely room for everybody. I couldn't agree more. So if you're listening to this, this is your sign to if you've been thinking about doing it, just do it. You have to start somewhere, right? Like no one starts their Instagram or their TikTok with a million followers. Like you have everyone starts from zero. Yeah, exactly. And just find the joy in it. And I think also just realizing that like kind of putting the metrics aside. I know I've had to do that over the last few years and just kind of create the content you want to create because you enjoy creating it. And that will be more fulfilling than anything. Oh, absolutely. Because if you are doing this for fame or money or whatever, you're not going to last very long because it's it's a tough field and so you really do have to enjoy what you put out there because there are there are many times where you put hours and weeks and days and months into content and it doesn't do well and it can be really frustrating and so if you're in it for the wrong reasons you're not going to find any joy in it and so to to do it because you love it is the only way yeah i i agree 100 percent and speaking of social media, I wanted to touch on a recent TikTok that you did, which was really cute. It was different skincare myths. And I, I, I found a lot of them are ones that I hear very often. So I wanted to ask you about a couple of the ones that you've covered in that video. The first one being, being drinking water for dry skin. This is something I see all over, like wellness influencers saying to drink water to hydrate your skin. Can you tell us a little bit about why that's maybe not necessarily true? Yeah, so I don't want anyone to come at me. Obviously, drinking water and staying hydrated is one of the most important things you can do. But if you have eczema or you have really dry skin or you have any of those other kind of diseases that predispose you to being dry, drinking water internally is not going to directly translate to your skin health. So our skin is like this barrier to the outside world. And so there's an outside and an inside. And so we have to make sure that we're taking care of it from the outside as well, which is one of the best ways that I can put it. You can help it internally a little bit with hydration, but you really do have to take good care of it because it's the barrier that we present to the entire world with the stresses that we deal with every day, the oxidation, pollution, we have to protect and fight against that, which is why it's so important that we're hydrating with moisturizers, we're wearing SPF, we're using antioxidants. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other ones I saw on there, which made me chuckle because my mom always used to do this, was vitamin E for like scars or cuts. Yeah, I don't know where that rumor started, but it's something I, I thought when even I was in residency before someone was like, n my Mo's attending was like, no, there's no research behind that. I'm like, what? My mind was blown, you know, because that's something, it's just like Neosporin. It's just, you grew up doing it. So it, it just became like common knowledge. And when I got to residency and heard that there was no studies or data behind it, like I, I couldn't believe it. But yeah, no evidence to support that vitamin E works for scars. 
However, it, you know, I always get people in the comments saying, no, I swear it worked for me. By all means, if it works for you, you like it, it's not harming you, keep doing it. But I'm just here to give you my evidence-based medicine and to say there's studies have been done and vitamin E doesn't work. If you want to invest in something that does work, silicone is the way to go. I tell every single one of my patients to use either silicone patches or silicone gel, that's gonna work infinitely better than anything else out there with the exception obviously of sunscreen. So if you're gonna do two things, you want to do silicone and you wanna do SPF to protect UV rays from making that scar more evident and from hyperpigmenting. That's a, we had a couple other questions about like surgical scars, specifically C-section scars. So at what point do you recommend that they start using the silicone? Like at what point in the healing journey? Yeah, so I do do a lot of surgeries. And so it's important after a surgery that you first let the area heal as best as possible. So an inflamed, open, new wound with sur with sutures, that's when you're gonna wanna take very gentle care of it. So I recommend gentle cleansing every day, and then you wanna keep it moist, which is contrary to what a lot of people think. They think you should let it dry out, and that's absolutely not the case. When you let it dry out and you let it scab up, it's going to inhibit wound healing and you're gonna end up with a worse scar. So once you're, as you're taking care of it, you wanna do Aquaphor or petroleum jelly, Vaseline to the area, keep it covered, and then once either sutures are removed or new skin has formed over, that's when it's safe to start using your silicone. When you use silicone, it's really important that you're using it more frequently enough and long enough. So it's not enough to just do it like for a week or something. You really do have to do it for many weeks to months. So I tell my patients anywhere between six weeks to six months or even longer, just depending on where you are at, how good of a healer you are and how happy you are with the scar. So you can stop when essentially you're happy with it. Okay, good to know. And are there any brands that you would recommend? Cause I know we're gonna get that question. Yeah, I love ScarAway. It is available at any of the drug stores, but honestly, anything that's that has silicone in it, it's gonna work way better than anything else. Okay, okay, good to know. One other question we got from the audience is somebody who's planning a wedding or an other, you know, another big event, what is an easy skincare routine, a prep routine that they can do so that their skin looks the best on their big day? So the most important thing is to make sure that you're starting early enough. So I've had it happen many times where people come in, you know, two weeks before their wedding and they're like, oh, I want all these things done. I'm like, no, we're not, we're not touching your skin right now. So you really want to try to start at least six months to even up to a year, depending on what your needs are. So you obviously want to get started in a good skincare routine. So if you want to help with discoloration, fine lines, wrinkles, you want to make sure you're investing in a good sunscreen. You're investing in things like retinols, tretinoin, peptides, things like that, that do take some time to see effects. Secondly, if you're going to invest in things like procedures, you wanna give that enough time to work. So if you're doing something like Botox, you wanna do that at least two to three months ahead of time because you wanna make sure that it's perfect for your big day. So typically in my clinic, for example, I'll do Botox and I'll always do a two week follow up to make sure they're totally happy with it. At that point in time, we'll do a touch up to make sure that they're happy. Other things that you wanna consider if you wanna do things like Morpheus for skin tightening, or you wanna do laser or microneedling, those typically take several sessions to see results and they don't happen overnight. So for example, example microneedling and microneedling with radio frequency like Morpheus, you do the treatment and you don't see results right away. So it takes a couple of weeks to months for that collagen to build in the skin to get tighter. So that's why I recommend starting six to 12 months ahead of time so that you look great and you're happy with your skin for your big day. Yeah, those are all great tips. And you mentioned a couple of things. Number one, peptides. What? So there is a incredible new world of peptides in skincare right now, and it can be incredibly overwhelming. It's a, it's a topic that I get questions a lot about all the time. Like I think people just want kind of a, a breakdown because there are so many and we know that not all of them are effective. So do you have any favorite products, favorite brands, or maybe just some basic advice for anybody who wants to incorporate peptides into their routine? Yeah, so I feel like you're right. Peptides is a very confusing topic, but it's also a very large topic that I think we can do an entire podcast on peptides and still not cover it. But I think I just wanna keep it simple. Essentially, go with a peptide 
with a brand that you know and trust and you know that they're gonna do a good formulation of it. So peptides, what they are, are they are made of amino acids that become proteins in our body that help to build collagen and build elastin in our skin to give us that more youthful appearance, plumper looking skin, help with fine lines and wrinkles. So I like ones from, again, brands that I know and trust. I personally love the peptides from Naturium. I love the ones from Cetaphil. So they don't have to be uber expensive. You can actually get pretty affordable ones that work well. I think the most important thing with peptides is using it consistently. So you don't wanna just use it every now and then and hope to get results. You have to do it and be consistent with it and make it a part of your skincare routine to see the results from it. Yeah, so true. And what do you think about using it in combination with other ingredients? Because that's some pushback I get a lot. People don't want to incorporate it with their vitamin C or in their same routine or the same routine with their retinoid, things like that. So peptides tend to be one of the easiest ingredients to pair with things. So I don't tend to find any irritation or issues when I pair peptides with any other ingredients, even vitamin C or retinol, because in and of themselves, peptides are anti-inflammatory and they can reduce inflammation and redness in the skin. So it's actually a great thing to pair with all these other ingredients. So I don't find any issues with mixing that into your skincare routine. Yeah, I agree. I almost think of them like a freebie. Like there are certain ingredients that in my head, they're like, this is a freebie I can put anywhere that's not gonna cause me any issues. Yeah, exactly. So we also had some questions about postpartum hair loss, and you've done a lot of content about that because you've been through, you know, the postpartum process twice now. So recently, what advice can you give to people who are struggling with it? It can be a really hard time for a lot of people, especially if they're not expecting it. So what what can you tell our audience to kind of get them through that time? So postpartum hair loss can be one of the most devastating things that I see people come in and I've experienced it myself so I can just relate to people and what they're going through. People come in with clumps and bags of hair and they are absolutely in tears and devastated at how much hair they're losing. And it can be extraordinarily traumatic because I think hair is a huge part of our identity. And so while some people maybe consider it cosmetic, I think a lot of us just have so much invested in our hair and who we are. So I just wanna say that if you're dealing with it, you're not alone. I'm currently going through it, or at least I'm I'm pretty much through it and I'm I'm starting to grow some of my hair back here. Um, And it's, (laughs) yeah, it's it's hilarious to see this hair grow back, but um, just know that it happens to the majority of women and other people, there are other reasons to get it, but it happens to the majority of women postpartum and it happens approximately two to three months after you deliver. So it's called telogen effluvium, and it's when there's a shock to the body system. And for whatever reason, it causes your hair to shift more into the shedding phase, which is called telogen. And that starts two to three months after you have a baby or the traumatic event, hospitalization, sickness, illness, new medication, and then it lasts anywhere between six to nine months. And so during that time, it comes out and it feels like clumps. It's on your shower, it's in your hairbrush, it's on the floor. And so again, it's very traumatic, but once you go through that, the majority of people, they do recover. That shedding stops and the hair starts to grow back very in a very funny way. It comes back <laughs> with all these little baby hairs and it looks like, for me, I almost have bangs, but it will eventually come back. So just know you're not alone. There's not much you have to do about it, unfortunately, good and bad, right? Like you, there are some things that you can try, but for most people, it's just kind of hand-holding and knowing that the process will do its thing and you'll get your hair back. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's important to note because in the world that we live in now where the hair category is just expanding, 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 there's so many serums and vitamins and lights and all these things. And while they can be beneficial, I think it's so important for people to understand that it is a self-limiting process. And even if you do nothing, you know, you're going to be, it's, you're going to come out on the other side of it. And I think sometimes these companies like to kind of prey on that situation. It is really hard for so many people, but even if you do nothing, your, your hair will grow back. Yep, exactly. And I think you were one of the first accounts that I saw really endorse supplements for different skin concerns like acne and really 
presenting the evidence behind it. I know I learned about zinc from you and I started incorporating it into my practice. So can you tell um, the audience a little bit about, let's let's start with acne. Like what are some supplements that you think might be beneficial for some people with acne? Yeah, so I think before we get into this conversation, I think it's important that as an allopathic Western medical doctor, we're not really taught this in medical school, but it's important to know that there are people out there who want to know about this, who don't particularly want to do traditional Western medicine. And it's really important that us as physicians and providers, we just keep an open mind to what people are doing because you want to, that you want them to trust you and you want to give them sound advice. So once I realized that is when I started to kind of dive into these more, what, what you would call natural treatments for it. Now I put natural in quotations because I don't love that term, but it, people are gonna come in and they're gonna ask me, well, what can I do holistically to help with my acne? And so acne is a big one. While traditionally we do recommend things like benzoyl peroxide, tretinoin, clindamycin, or oral antibiotics like doxycycline or isotretinoin, there are there is evidence to support that zinc can help with acne. And so I tell people that if you have mild to moderate acne and you want to give it a try, there's no harm in doing it. I just want them to know the, the risk or the side effects, which is essentially with zinc, um, having GI upset and upset stomach, some nausea and issues like that, and just having realistic expectations. So if someone's coming to me and they have severe cystic scarring acne, I tell them, I, I really don't think that zinc is the way to go. I think that something like isotretinoin is, is going to be way better for you. Um, and we are kind of on a time crunch when people are dealing with scarring acne because the longer that that acne is there, the more likely they are to scar. So just understanding the expectations, the limitations um, of these more natural supplements is very important when I'm making recommendations to the public and to my patients. Yeah, that's a really good point. And since we're on the subject of zinc, actually one of the audience questions was, how can she make the Botox around her eyes last longer? Do you tend to recommend zinc for your patients or mention it to them when it comes to longevity with their with their neurotoxin? Yeah, definitely. I bring it up um, and I bring it up on social media too because I don't think that it's something that a lot of people know about um, is taking zinc a few days before you get Botox and taking it after you get Botox can actually increase the longevity of Botox. Now, with that being said, it's not like a huge difference. It's not the difference between, you know, three months and a year. But if you're the, the people that I recommend it to are people who come in and say, my Botox wears off in like six weeks, which is me. I see that happening in people who have been getting Botox for a long time people who have high metabolisms, people who work out quite a bit. So if you want to potentially get a little bit more bang for your buck out of your Botox, then it might be worth it to invest in do zinc. Otherwise, if you are getting, you're happy with the duration of your Botox, no need to necessarily take it. And is it something that they need to, you mentioned a few days before, do they need to take it for the duration of the three months or whatever it is that they expect it to last? Not necessarily, but again, zinc does have other benefits. So if you wanted to take zinc for, you know, your acne or if you're using it to help with warts, which is another reason that I recommend zinc, then by all means, you can continue to take zinc as your as a supplement every day. Good to know. I feel like these are really hot tips that not a lot of people take. Okay, one other question was this uh, audience uh, viewer listener is using tretinoin just once per week and she's still getting dryness that she can't get past. She's asking, is it doing more harm than good at this point? Should I just stop it altogether? What are your tips for somebody like that? So there is very few people that absolutely can't tolerate tretinoin. And there's so many tips and tricks to be able to make sure that you tolerate it. Number one is to look at the strength that you're on. If you are on, say, tretinoin 0.1, then maybe you should consider talking with your provider about dropping you down to something that's a little less strong, a little bit more manageable, something like adapalene, or even starting with a retinol and then working your way up from that. Another, two more other tricks that I really like for it is the retinol sandwich or the retinoid sandwich, which I'm sure you know very well, but it's essentially you put a barrier between your skin and that retinoid. So you put a moisturizer on first, 
then you put a retinoid on, and then you sandwich that with another moisturizer. And what that does, again, is it acts as a barrier between your skin and the retinoid, so it reduces irritation, while that second layer of the moisturizer is going to hydrate the skin, reduce dryness, reduce the peeling. So doubling that moisturizer is a huge way to reduce the side effects of retinoids. The third thing is something called short contact therapy. So if someone is like, I absolutely can't tolerate a retinoid no matter what I do, then you don't have to leave it on. You can put the retinoid on, let it sit for like 30 minutes to an hour or two at night, and then wash it off. That way it's not sitting on your skin, causing inflammation and irritation all night long. And it's something that you're at least still getting the benefits of just in a shorter contact. Yes. Exactly. Do you feel like you, when you're prescribing a retinoid to your patients, do you feel like your education is so long and you're talking for an hour with them? Do you, do you provide them a lot of education when it comes time to start a retinoid? Always, because I know that if I don't give them that information, they're going to come back in two months and say, I tried to do that retinoid. It didn't work. It was too irritating and my acne is not better. And so I think I save everyone a lot of time and energy and frustration by telling them that up front. But I, and I think you know this as well, is what you tell someone in the office and in the visit, they don't, they only remember like 20% of that if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. So I, tell them, I explain it to them, I repeat it, I say it again at the end of the visit, I ask them for questions, and then I write it down and highlight it. So I do have a paper in clinic that I have all of my tips and tricks written down on. That way they can go home and be like, sandwich? What does she mean? Oh, okay, that's, that's what she meant. So I always find that repetition and handouts go a long way. Yeah, I agree. We do a handout as well. And I always tell them as when I see their eyes kind of start to widen and I say, don't worry, this is already written down for you. I just like you to hear me verbalize it first. And then they kind of like have a sigh of relief. Like, okay, I don't have to like memorize every word she's saying. But it is there is a lot of education when it comes to retinoids. But that education really makes or breaks your experience, which is going to make or break your results. Because if you if you don't use it, if you can't use it, you're never going to get to the good part. So it's so important to follow that that education. So any tips for neck skin? And we had a lot of complaints from, from people calling in about either tech neck or crepey skin on the neck. I think the neck is one of those things that you know, in your 30s and 40s, you kind of start to notice and you're like all of a sudden like, oh crap, I haven't been doing anything about my neck and now it's staring at me in the face. Yeah. Well, for those listening, if you are in your teens or early 20s, this is your sign to treat your neck like your face. So we're all investing all this time and energy and money into skincare for our face, you know, procedures for our face, but we're neglecting our neck. And our neck is just as exposed to the sun as our face is. And our neck is a dead giveaway for our age. So I think there's this photo floating around the internet where there's someone who apparently, I don't know the whole story, used sunscreen on their face their whole life, but never their neck. Um, and that is an obvious difference between how you can really improve the appearance of aging on your face, but the neck can still show signs of aging. So number one thing, keep it simple, make it easy, save money, take your skincare for your face, extend it down to your neck. And that's including sunscreen, moisturizers, your tretinoin. Now, if the neck is too sensitive for that, you can kind of dilute it down or you can use a retinol or one specifically made for the neck. But you don't have to necessarily get a neck cream. You can just kind of take the things from your face and, and move it down to the neck. Another thing that you can do is lifestyle changes. So, you know, in this day and age, we're all sitting here like this with our phone, with our neck down, looking at our phone. So you can try to do different things where your phone's up like this. I know that's uncomfortable, but that's where tech neck comes from is consistently keeping your head down like this and causing those wrinkles there. Now, these are normal. They're a normal part of aging, but you can slow that aging by some lifestyle changes. Another thing that you can try is we do do in the office Botox or other, you know, microneedling or lasers, again, radio frequency with microneedling. So those are all in-office treatments. If you're already like in your, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, where it's a little too late for sunscreen to do a huge difference for your neck, um, obviously sunscreen's always going to help. But um, those are some procedures that you can visit your dermatology provider and um, see if you're a candidate for. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is becoming one of those areas that I am asked about constantly all the time. It's it's one it's just a topic that comes up all the time now. I think 
because we're all, you know, I think the moment the term technic came on the came came out, everyone was all of a sudden so concerned and realizing. It's interesting too. I wonder, I would love to see, like I wish I could see like a good quality photograph of what next looked like you know 20 years before we were all on our phones because as you said that's what this is from and we all have it because we are all constantly looking down at work I mean so much of our life is on devices so it's it's so interesting okay next question for somebody in their 20s maybe their early 20s they're just kind of getting into skincare what number one at what age do you think people should start a skincare routine aside from maybe just sunscreen, which we recommend at an early age. But also in their in their early 20s, if they're really getting into skincare, what's like a good starter regimen for someone? So like you said, I think everyone at any point in their life needs to be using sunscreen, whether you're you know, a two-year-old or you're a 90-year-old, there's so many benefits to sunscreen. So starting a skincare routine, the earlier, the better in regards to that and creating a habit. But when we're talking about just a general skincare routine. I think being in your teenage years is the time to do it because one, it sets up um, consistency for the rest of your life. You get kind of used to it and it sets you up for success. And in your teenage years, you are going through a lot of puberty and, and hormonal imbalances and things like that where you're dealing with acne and oiliness and breakouts. And so it's a really good habit to start a skincare routine. But I have been seeing so many I think you've probably seen these TikToks of kids going into Sephora and buying like $80 moisturizers and using retinol. Like you absolutely don't have to do that. I think when you're starting a regular skincare routine, you just really want to stick to the basics, something that's going to support your skin barrier, give you healthy skin. So that's going to be a cleanser, a moisturizer and sunscreen. So again, if you're a teenage, you're in your teenage years, you're in your early twenties and you're not particularly concerned with aging as you shouldn't be, because those are your glory years. You know, you have all the collagen in the world. That is when you want to make sure you're just keeping your skin barrier healthy and intact. Yeah, absolutely. And since you mentioned price, you are kind of the queen of affordable skincare. And I want to touch on that a little bit. Can you give the audience maybe some favorite products, favorite brands, or even your philosophy on maybe which products you think are worth splurging on, if any, and which are better, you know, left to the budget category? Yeah, I think that the majority of your skincare, like 90% of it, you really can just get at the drugstore and for most people too. Now, if you really want to see really good results, then I think it's totally fine to maybe splurge on things like your vitamin C. I do tend to see that vitamin C when it's a little bit more pricey, it's because there's a lot more that goes into that formulation and the packaging and the studies behind it. So I really think that splurging on a vitamin C is totally fine, but otherwise there's so many wonderful and affordable sunscreens, not even just at the drugstore, but you know, at Target and Sephora, there there just are these, um, some K-beauty sunscreens that are very affordable. Um, even Sunbomb is a brand that I really love that I've worked with and they are so innovative with their sunscreens that you don't have to splurge anymore on a very expensive sunscreen. Same goes for cleansers. I mean, all every single cleanser I use is an affordable, cheap drugstore cleanser. And I recommend that to my patients all the time. And that's where I see the best results is when people don't try to complicate it with, you know, AHAs and all these BHAs and these scrubs and these very fancy cleansers. Just, you just need to cleanse your skin and keep your skincare, skin barrier intact. So I think the majority of effective skincare products can be found down the street at your local drugstore. Yeah, I agree. When uh, I had Susan on the show and she was saying one of the things that she loves about affordable skincare, and of course, Naturium is like one of my favorite affordable skin brands, but that you people don't skimp on it, right? Because at least I don't. Like when I'm using my affordable products, I really, you know, like especially cleanser, I'll use a bunch of it. But if I'm using something that I splurged on, I'm so like, I'm so, you know, scarce and scared to use too much. So definitely using products that are more within your budget, you're going to get more of a benefit because you're actually going to be consistent. You're not going to be afraid of of not using it. I couldn't agree with that more. And I didn't even realize I was doing that, but I have, you know, a few skin better products that are on the pricier side and I'll find myself using maybe a little less than I probably should. Cause I'm like, ah, I got to make this 
bottle lasts and I want to spend another $150 on skincare, but with something that's like, you know, 15 bucks at the, at CVS or whenever, I'm just like, yeah, slather it on. Yeah. Let's get more. <laughs> I know. I'm the same way. Skin Butter is actually a brand I get asked about a lot. They're like alpha. I've never used the brand, even though I know it's so popular, but I get asked about it all the time. Is it one that you enjoy? I do. Yeah, we sell it in our office and I hate being a salesman. Like I don't want to force someone to buy something or feel like I'm you know, making them do it, but I really do like that brand and I and I trust in their science, that and you know, Elastin and SkinCeuticals, those are the more high-end brands, but they are pricey for a reason. I hate when brands are pricey just to be pricey, but sometimes the price is justifiable with the amount of science and innovation that goes into it. But yeah, Skin Better, I love their even tone. I love their vitamin C. It's a really, really great vitamin C for those who feel like they break out from vitamin C or can't tolerate a vitamin C. It's super stable. It really brightens your skin. So that's one I've used before that I really like that I recommend to my patients who say that they're more acne prone or sensitive and vitamin C, all the other vitamin Cs haven't worked for them. Yeah. Okay. That's a good tip. Have you used their alpha ret before? Do you have any thoughts on that? I haven't per like personally used it, but that's because I have been on a prescription tretinoin for years. I yeah. can literally tolerate to Zeratine, and so I don't necessarily need the alpha ret. But back to kind of that conversation we were having before when someone's like, oh, I've been on tretinoin and I can only use it once a week because it's so irritating the alpha ret would be something that I would recommend for them. So you're gonna get some of the benefits of like a prescription tretinoin without any of that irritation. It's super tolerable. Okay, that's good to hear because that's one I get asked about all the time. And one last little topic, we had a lot of questions come in asking for recommendations for XYZ, but that was a clean product or was clean beauty. Can you touch a little bit on how you approach maybe that in your patients who have those concerns about clean beauty and how you what you think about the subject in general? So I don't have any, so when it comes to clean beauty, it's not that I have anything against it. I just hate that some clean beauty brands demonize everything else. Like it's fine if you want to not have X, Y, and Z ingredients in your product. And there's definitely a population of people that are looking for that. But I don't think that it's fair or right to fear monger and to make people feel bad about not using clean beauty. So again, I think that there's great ideas behind clean beauty and I don't mind using the products and some of them are very effective, but I don't like brands that put other brands down for not being clean, which again, clean is made up. There's no like FDA regulations surrounding that term or natural. And so it's just like people came together and just decided to make that term up. And so there's, there's not a lot of regulation behind that, which also kind of frustrates me. Yeah. I, whenever a follower or even a patient asks for that recommendation, I always say, can you, can you explain to me a little bit more about what you mean by clean so I can understand? And I think it's a good way to like open up that conversation too, because sometimes they don't really quite know, you know, I'm like, oh, is there, is there an ingredient you're trying to avoid? Or is there something that, you know, f like philosophically, is there something that you are against? So I think it helps open up that conversation because it just has become this term that to so many means something, but actually means very little. And as you said, I feel the same way. I actually use a lot of clean brands, especially like my makeup products, because it just happens to be like I'm a very, I'm very simple with my makeup. And those brands tend to have like the very simple kind of everyday makeup formulations. And so I will, I notice I get these questions a lot. Like, do you only use clean beauty? Like, absolutely not. I don't even, I couldn't even tell you like actually in my routine, which are and which aren't. I just, some of them have that label on them. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally agree. Like, I don't even know off the top of my head anything that's like super clean. I just know products that work well for me, my patients, and that's what I recommend. Yeah, absolutely. So to wrap up, can you let us know what is your holy grail skin product if you had to choose only one? Does this include sunscreen or do we have to Let's say that no because sunscreen is <laughs> always going to be the answer. Yeah, exactly. It's It's got to be a retinol or a retinoid. I mean, it's just really, you're pro that's probably going to be the answer you're going to get from most people too. But I feel like if you're 
if you were building a an anti-aging routine and you could only pick two things, it's always going to be sunscreen and retinol or tretinoin or retinoid because it just does so much. It helps to stimulate your collagen. It helps with fine lines and wrinkles. It helps to give you that glow. It helps with hyperpigmentation, discoloration, acne. I mean, it really is the gold standard and the king of skincare when it comes to my holy grail choice. I really missed it when I was pregnant and I didn't realize because I'd been using it for so long just how big of an impact it made on my skin. And then when I was pregnant and I had to stop it, I was like, oh my God, this really, really works so well. And I was seriously missing it. And then, you know, the second I delivered, I had like my tretinoin and Botox ready to go. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I always joke that I had like my little tret samples in my hospital bag. Like I was like, oh, as soon as I'm like my first night of skincare after she's out, I'm going to be putting my tretinoin on. Yeah, absolutely. So funny. Okay. And what is your most underrated skin tip? Underrated skin tip or underrated skincare ingredient? Either one. We can do ingredient. So my, I just did a reel on this. I love sulfur. I just think sulfur needs to be out there more. It needs to be hyped up. I, we need to make this the year of sulfur because there are so many things that I use for to treat with sulfur. And like it really is just such a multifunctional ingredient that helps to calm skin it helps with perioral dermatitis rosacea acne i mean it is an ingredient that does it all and i don't know why it's not incorporated into more skincare products over the counter yeah speaking of that are there any like more cosmetically elegant products that have sulfur that you would recommend like i know that i know like of the ones i can think of it's just like they're sometimes not the best to use do you know of any like that you prefer or like formulations that you like yeah, so there's not a lot out there, honestly. And I think that if anyone's listening that's a skincare formulator, like you need to get on the cosmetically elegant sulfur bandwa bandwagon. But you know, I think Naturium makes a pretty nice one. They make a sulfur spot treatment, which is good. Otherwise, I just kind of direct people because if you're really dealing with bad perioral dermatitis or rosacea, I just direct them to Amazon. And there's this like cheap bar of soap that mm -hmm. works really well. It's not the prettiest, but it gets the job done. It works. It works, right? <laughs> okay. And very last question. If you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Give yourself grace. You know, I spent my whole life with this one goal of becoming a physician. I always was just such a perfectionist and every step of my life was always so regimented and I never got, and I, and I was always down on myself. Like I need to do better. I need to be better. I need to get better grades to achieve what I want to do. And so I wish I could just look back and say, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail. It's okay to not be perfect. And I'm trying to live by that mantra. Now it's, it's hard to do if you've been a perfectionist your whole life to break that. But with kids and the social media career and being a dermatologist, I really can't do it all. And I really can't be perfect. So I'm starting to try and give myself more grace and realize, you know, it's, it's difficult to wear all these different hats and all I can ask myself to do is to just do my best at the end of the day. Yeah, I agree. I think, I, you know, I went to school with so many high achieving people and I think that's such a common trait, especially amongst people in the medical field. It's like we're so hard on ourselves. And I'm sure when you had your kids, it probably opened up your eyes too, because I always think of like my daughter as a little version of me. And it breaks my heart to think of like, I don't ever want her to feel that way. You know, like I don't want her to feel those thoughts. So I think that's a really good, a really good note to end on. Just give yourself a little bit of grace, right? We all need it, especially in today's world, the way that we all work and have to show up in every facet all the time. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing all your knowledge, you guys. If you don't follow Dr. Lindsay, her handle's at, at Derm Guru on, all, on, on TikTok and Instagram, same, right? And oh my gosh, you can just get lost for hours in her content. And I promise you, you can learn more just scrolling those TikToks than you could probably reading a Derm book. So <laughs> thank you so much for, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. And thank you for taking the time to be here. Well, it was an honor to be here. Thank you so much. I feel like we need to catch up some other time in life, but I very much enjoyed being here. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to listen to the episode. Absolutely. 
Dr. Lindsay, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's not every episode that I personally learned something new, but I took away quite a few things that I learned that I'm going to start incorporating into my own practice. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'm definitely running to the store to buy some sulfur soap. If you haven't already rated and reviewed the show, it would mean so much to me. It really helps the show to grow and get to the ears of more people who love skin, hair, and beauty. And I'll talk to you next week, skin enthusiasts. Oh, 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 o